often say, because <laughs> uh, I'd spend all week saying it, but as I was saying to, to Dave earlier on, when you study something, you could go here, you could go there. So to try to bring it to um, a coherent message, <clears throat> well, it's something I'm definitely going to ask God to do this morning um, because it's really it's God's word, so we want him to speak. So please join me in prayer as we open the word together. Now, Father, we thank you for your word, <clears throat> the word inspired by the Holy Spirit through men of God years ago, preserved down through the ages that we might have it in our hands today. Lord, as we open the Bible, as we look at your word, we pray that that same spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, will inspire it afresh to our hearts, that we may understand your word to us. Lord, I pray that you would use the words I speak that are worth to hold on to, Lord, and everything else may just float away on the breeze. That, Lord, be glorified, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was challenged and, and led, uh, as I was preparing for this, by Don's sermon last week. Seek the wisdom of God, he said, because <clears throat> I had some ideas. And I thought, yeah, I really should seek the wisdom of God. And wonderfully, all my ideas got dumped, which is really helpful because they probably weren't that good. But God led me there to this particular passage in Ezekiel, uh, the river of life. Now, Ezekiel is a, is a, you know, if I'm being honest, it's a hard book to read. Uh, it's not the first book you, you flick to when you're looking for uh, words of consolation and hope. Uh, it's, it's a tough read. But there are... The whole message of the book, of course, is a profound message of uh, God's promise of restoration. And at the end of the book, we've got this uh, wonderful chapter. But just a bit of background before I get there as to who Ezekiel was. He was a prophet. He was contemporary with Obadiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. So his ministry and message was primarily to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. And by this stage, many of the elites, that is the the priests and the artisans and the builders, they've been already taken captive to Babylon. It was the first stream of captives were taken away, including Ezekiel himself. And in fact, his entire ministry to Judah was given from his captivity in Babylon. There was still a puppet government back home in the kingdom of Judah. King Zedekiah was there, and the message of God to Judah was both the judgment on their apostasy and a promise of restoration. Now Ezekiel's name means God strengthens. And the call of Ezekiel was to trust God, to lean on his power and strength. And the book can be roughly divided into two parts. The first uh, chapters, first chapters 1 to 32, are really prophecies of judgment. These are the doom and gloom chapters. You know, if you, if you start reading those... Uh, but you need to get through to the end because following the final siege and fall of Jerusalem, from chapters 33 to the end of the book, we have these prophecies and promises of restoration. God gives a vision of a future where the people are restored, not just to their homeland, but also to their relationship. And God gives a vision of the new temple where he will live with his people. Now the description of this temple in chapters 40 to 46 that's also a bit dry. You know, there's lots of measurements and lots of uh, detail. In fact, when I was reading it, I sort of had to, to try and figure out how long is a cubit? Uh, how long, how many metres is that? Is that as big as my house? Oh, it's bigger than my house. So, you know, you want to sort of try to get perspective. But then we get to chapter 47, which is what I want to talk about today. This gives us a wonderful picture of the grace of God, the sovereignty of God and the power of God in making all things new. And I have, I have, uh, what's the word? I've dragged my son to the pulpit. Isaac is going to bring the reading for us today. So Isaac, thank you for volunteering. He couldn't really say no. When dad says, would you bring a Bible reading? He's not going to say no. He said yes. Thank you, son. Ezekiel chapter 47. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me 
out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Englaim. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will the fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Thank you, my son. That is a powerful chapter. So let's explore some of the truths of this vision. First thing I want to mention is that we see the river of life flows from the house of God. The river which brings with it the blessings of God, life, abundance, peace and fulfilment, doesn't flow from the palace or the parliament or any man-made governance. The scripture is clear that we must respect those in authority over us. Kings and governments draw their authority from God they are there by God's permission, but it is not from them that the river of life flows. It doesn't flow from the marketplace or from the business sector. Trade and commerce are important, but they will not and they cannot bring the sort of blessings that God offers. The river doesn't flow from the sports or recreation parks or from theatres or concert halls. All these places of recreation and relaxation are great to lift the spirits. And if you're a Geelong fan, I expect your spirits are sky high at the moment. But they don't bring life. These places don't bring life. No, the river flows from the temple of God. A temple that was described in minute detail in the previous chapters. A temple that God built. 1 Corinthians 3.26 tells us that we who are believers in Jesus are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in us. And 1 Peter 2 verse 5 says, you yourselves like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. The river flows from the house of God to be a blessing to the world around it. We are the temple of God. Do we see life flowing from our church community? We, the temple of God, can we see a flow of blessing? I see the kindness of our church flowing into the community through the ministry of the catering committee. I see the kindness flowing out into the world through the gifts of shoeboxes or the Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. I see the kindness flowing even within, in the warmth of our greetings on Sunday mornings, handshakes and smiles that say, I am so glad to be in worship with you. And that may be small, but that's how it starts. You see that in the text. You see that it starts as a trickle. 
River grows in size and effect, starts as a trickle but becomes a stream to walk in and it becomes a river to swim in. Ezekiel 47.3 says, As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, did the, did the conversion, that's about 500 meters, half a kilometer, he led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits, that led me through water that was knee deep. And here's a curiosity. See, every other river gets stronger as it goes downstream because of feeder streams feeding into it. But this river of life is different. It gets deeper and stronger all by itself. All the water flowed directly from the source. This river didn't need feeder streams to go deeper and deeper. God's river of life doesn't need anything added to it from the world around it to make it grow. All by itself, the river gets deeper and deeper and deeper still. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross. Because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Why would he say, do you see this? It's something that we need to look at, we need to be aware of. <clears throat> so I'm going to say a few times, do you see this? Do you see what God is saying? The river of God flows out from the temple, getting deeper and deeper as it goes. Now God's river brings increasing blessings to more and more people and places. And the way the depth of the river is always increasing gives us an invitation to keep on going deeper and deeper with God. There's always more and more of God and of his blessings to discover and experience. And God's desire is that we should be continually moving deeper and deeper with him. Now some Christians are content to just dip their toes in, just paddle around the edges, just ankle deep perhaps. Some Christians like to go ankle deep but no further. And some Christians like to wade in the river of life but are afraid to go any deeper. Perhaps they're scared that they will end up over their heads. Perhaps they're afraid that they will drown. But God will never let us drown. His promise in Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Too few Christians are brave and trusting enough to go swimming in God's river of life, to be out of the depths where their feet can't touch the bottom anymore. Just to be carried along by the current of God's love and power to wherever God wishes to take them. None of us should really want to spend our lives keeping our feet firmly anchored to dry land. We shouldn't be content just to tip our toes into God. We have the choice, each one of us. We can paddle around the edges or we can go for a swim. And we should all be ready to dive in deeply into the river of life. We just can't expect there's going to be a change. And I found this picture which I thought was very appropriate. I don't know if you can read that. I do like the peanut. So Snoopy's sitting a bit droopy-eyed. He says, yesterday I was a dog. Today I'm a dog. Tomorrow I'll probably still be a dog. There's such little hope for advancement, he says. Well, in the Christian life, poor old Snoopy, it's just more of the same. But in the Christian life, there's always hope for advancement with God. We can always go deeper with God. And when we experience the depths of God, we find the things that we used to think important aren't all that important anymore. The parts of life we felt we couldn't do without, they sort of seem empty and fake. Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. The fullness of life is what God offers us. Do you see that? The river of life is the fullness of life. 
Another truth from the text. Let's say truth. That's two Fs in truth. Another truth from our text. The river brings life. The river brings life and what life it brings. It's supernatural life. It's abundant life. It's unexpected life. We see in the text that there are trees along the banks of the river that produce fruit for eating every month. I mean, I know some of the orchardists around here and they work hard to prepare their apple trees for the annual crop. But the trees that line the river of life produce all year round, every month, and not only fruit for food but leaves for healing. Life that brings life. And see where the river flows to. The scripture says in verse 8 that the water flows out to the eastern region, goes down into the Arabah where it empties into the sea. But it, when it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Wherever the river flows, there will be swarms of living creatures and a great number of fish because it flows there and makes the water fresh. So wherever the river flows, everything will flourish. Fishermen will stand by the shore from Engedi to Eng Eglaim. They will spread their nets to catch fish of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. It flows from the temple down into the Arabah, the section of the Jordan Rift Valley that is really a desert. And if I can get geographical for a moment, the Jordan River flows southward from the Sea of Galilee into the desert, downhill all the way, because that's what rivers do, until eventually at around 400 metres, 400 metres below sea level, it reaches the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the only place on earth that David Attenborough couldn't make a documentary because there's no life. There's no life there, nothing to film, nothing to watch, no fish, no plants. Oh, there could be some hardy amoeba floating around in the water, but nothing. The thing about the Dead Sea, it's so salty and full of minerals that nothing can survive. It, it has a salinity level, I found out, of 34%. That's almost 10 times more than the ocean. It's no wonder that nothing can survive. So let's just test our high school chemistry here. Yes, if you've got a glass of salty water and a glass of pure water and you pour them together into a bowl, will that water be salty or pure? Of course it'll be salty. It might be less salty than the first glass of water, but it's not going to be pure. But with God, when he sends the living water, it doesn't dilute the impurities. It eradicates them. Ezekiel's vision was of the living water entering the Dead Sea and making it so that fish could thrive there and it becomes a verdant place of plenty. God gives the vision. He gives a promise of purity where there was pollution, of abundance where there was scarcity, of hope where there was despair, and of life where there was death. This image of the river is a theme that runs all through Scripture. It's promised in many places. It's a symbol of God's grace and provision. Psalm 46 points towards this river of blessing. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Isaiah looked forward to the streams in the desert which God would provide to bless his chosen people. Isaiah 43, 18 says, Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing, now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honour me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. And the prophet Joel had the same picture of a river flowing out of the temple, bringing life everywhere it flowed. Joel 3.18 says, In that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. So all through the Old Testament we can read these images of living water, refreshing streams, a river of life. 
In the New Testament, in the Gospels, we read of Jesus referencing these images to identify himself as the living water. <clears throat> in John chapter 7, Jesus made this promise to his disciples. He said, let everyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And I mentioned earlier on about the evidence that flows from this temple, this house of the Lord, as the Spirit moves through us. These living streams of living waters flow out to be a blessing. In John chapter 4, we read of the encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well when Jesus asks the woman for a drink. And in the conversation that follows, Jesus said that whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, and the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. But now I'd just like to draw our attention to a third reference in John's Gospel where Jesus demonstrated his claim to be the living water, not just with words, but with actions. In John chapter 5, we read the account of the healing of a man by the pool of Bethesda. Some time later, it says in John chapter 5, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool with five covered colonnades, which in Hebrew is called Bethesda. On these walkways lay a great number of the sick, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And one man there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized that he had spent a long time in this condition, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm on my way, someone else goes in before me. And then Jesus told him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Immediately the man was made well and he picked up his mat and began to walk. There's always been a, a story that's raised so many more questions in me than, than answers are given because you know, was there really something in the water? I mean, there was a strong belief that the waters of this pool could bring healing to the sick if the angel disturbed the water, if you were there at the right time and if you were the first one into the water. Now, honestly, I don't know if this belief had any basis in fact. Uh, I don't know if anyone had ever been healed by bathing in that pool. It may well have been that somebody had once. It may have just been a hopeful myth that was held on to. We see that in our own day and age where people will latch onto something that promises a better life, be it fad diets or get-rich-quick schemes, something that you really want to have a go at. <clears throat> but whatever the truth of the claims, of the waters of the pool of Bethesda. The Bible gives no comment on that. But what the Bible does say is that this paralytic man had been there for years and he always missed an opportunity to enter the waters. But still he waited. He waited until the day that Jesus walked by. Does anybody else think it was a bit odd that Jesus would ask this paralyzed man, paralyzed man sitting near the healing waters, who would say, do you want to get well? I thought that was an odd question. I mean, I might have said, can I help you into the waters? Can I hold back the crowds? Well, Jesus asked the right question. He asked the question that went straight to the heart of the man's condition. The poor man struggled for years with this condition. He couldn't even bring himself to give a direct answer. Instead, the answer he gave revealed a deeper, more painful burden than the need even for physical healing. I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Perhaps in the presence of the Lord, this desperate man unwittingly revealed a profound truth. Did his soul recognize the need for a helper, the helper, 
above any other need in his life. This man had no one to help him. No one. Can you imagine that? The isolation must have been as emotionally and spiritually crippling as was his physical condition. However, once the man allows Jesus in with his honest answer, once he responds to Jesus, it happens. Pick up your mat and walk. The authority in Jesus' voice, the authority, the same authority that spoke at the beginning of time when his voice thundered in commanding, let there be light. And there was no other possible outcome to that statement than that light was. There was no other possible outcome when Jesus said, stand up and walk. There was no need for that man to enter the so-called miraculous waters of the pool because Jesus, the living water, had brought healing. All the blessings of the river of life told in Ezekiel's vision are fulfilled in Jesus. As the water trickled from the temple and directed around the altar, the place of sacrifice, from there flowing into the dry places to bring refreshment and renewal, we understand that the crucifixion of Jesus echoes this. His blood trickled down from the cross where he sacrificed his life. This sacrifice making possible the complete forgiveness of our sins, not just the tidying up of our most obvious faults, but a complete clean. In the same way that the pure water made the salty water of the Dead Sea fresh, so the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Our lives no longer need to be stunted and shriveled. Jesus, the living water, brings newness and growth. And we, along with all the saints, can know the change that Jesus brings, hope from despair, joy from misery, life from death. And so I challenge you, as I challenge myself this morning, can we allow Jesus to speak his life-changing words to us? Will we abandon ourselves to the river of life? Will we allow the living water to flow through us? If we will, there will be change. Perhaps small at first, but as we have seen, the river of God flows from a trickle to a mighty river bringing blessing wherever it goes. Amen. Let me just close with a prayer. Lord, as we look at your word this morning, we recognize that your word is truth. Your word is a lamp to our feet. It guides us, Lord, in our walk with you. We thank you and praise you that you challenge us again to plunge deeply into the river of life, to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and flow through us, Lord, that the blessings of this river may be a blessing to our community, to our family and friends around us. So, Lord, we yield ourselves afresh to you. We say, come, Lord, fill us, flow through us, glorify yourself through us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, David. You're going to